Michael Crawford, CEO of the Source CRC. Welcome to this uh, webinar series. And shortly I'll introduce Associate uh, Professor Pete Dalhouse from Federation University. But just a, a quick word or two about the Source CRC for those who aren't directly familiar with us. Essentially, we're into our third year of a 10 year <coughs> length of a lifetime with funding from the Australian government and a whole range of partners and participants across Australia. We have 40 participants, a combination of universities, state agencies, industry bodies, and, and importantly, uh, 20 farmer groups, grower groups across Australia and New Zealand with Landcare Research New Zealand. And our main objective is to undertake R&D to give farmers the tools and knowledge they need to better manage their soils and to increase their productivity and profitability. You can find out more about the Soil CRC on our, uh, on our website, which uh, <coughs> you've no doubt gone to in, in going to, uh, to link the register for this, uh, this webinar, which I encourage you to go back there afterwards if you have any other questions. It's also on our chat uh, window. You can see some information there relating to it. Um, as we warm up, just uh, a couple of um, Advertisements for future webinars. Uh, we're, we're moving in this uh, COVID period to delivering a lot of our information online uh, to to give people the, the opportunity to find out what's coming out of our CRC. So we've got webinars uh, planned for the next uh, two months and beyond that we hope to have an ongoing program of, of a webinar roughly every, every fortnight uh, going forward. So in two weeks' time, uh, Mick Rose from New South Wales DPI to about herbicide residues in soil when persistence doesn't pay. In July 14th, <coughs> there's still a day, opportunities for activating consumer markets for good soil stewardship from uh, Professor Mark Morrison at Charles Sturt University. And then on the 28th of July, impacts of liquid injection of biosolids on soil, plants and groundwater by Dr. Aravind Serpanini from South East Water and Dr. Balaji Sasadri. From the University of Newcastle. You can register for them as you have done for this one through the uh, sourcerc.com.au website. So how this is going to run in a minute I'm going to pass over to, to Pete Dalhouse and also um, Andrew McLeod who's a research, who's a technical manager on, on the project that, that Peter leads. They'll take us through a, 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 a webinar for the next 20-25 minutes. We'll then have the opportunity to ask questions of, of Pete and Andrew. The way we'll ask questions is by typing them into the Q&A box, which you can access uh, generally through the bottom of your screen on, on Zoom. It'll, it'll pop up on, on the Q&A. Type in there and then we'll go through those questions uh, in a systematic way at the end of, of the period. Uh, <coughs> there is a chat function. Don't put the questions in the chat function. Put them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll, we'll, we will finish at uh, quarter two. Uh, the hour, wherever you're from, quarter to 12 here in um, the eastern states of Australia. And um, just another point to highlight is that this, uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available at a later date on our website. So without further ado at this stage, I will stop sharing. I will bring up, uh, <coughs> I'll introduce uh, Pete Dalhouse. Uh, Associate Professor Pete Dalhouse is at uh, Federation University of Australia. He's located at Ballarat to the northeast of Melbourne in Victoria in southeast Australia. I'm saying this recognising we've actually got quite an international audience uh, for our webinar today. So to give you some perspectives on, on what happens here in Australia. And um, Pete's going to talk to us about uh, why share your soil data which is, um, comes from his project that he's leading on visualising Australasia's soils. So I'll pass over to you. So, <clears throat> thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, so this webinar presents some of the findings to date in this Visualising Australasia's Soils project. This project's um, a project that uh, is fairly ambitious. It has about um, 20 members in this project. So there are uh, three universities, 
Federation University is the lead university in, in this project. And then there's um, Manuka Benua Land Care Research from New Zealand. And then um, 13 grower groups, um, a couple of catchment management authorities, and one industry partner, uh, industry service partner in this group. The, the aim of the project is really to establish a soil data federation for the soil CRC. So a federation's not a centralized database. A federation is really something where uh, the custodians expose their data to the federation on the fly if, if they can, according to the rules that they set. So in other words, we don't take the data. It's not going into a centralized database. The data is, is being accessed on the fly if we can from the databases that the custodians have in that sense. So the current web portal um, shows some of the public sector data that we've got in that federation at the moment. And you can access this via the Soil CRC website. So if you go to the Soil CRC com.au and you click on the soil data portal at the top of the page then uh, you'll get to the to this soil data portal uh, constructing the, the the soil data federation of course has certain research challenges you know? Th these are really grouped into three here. There's the value proposition. You know, why would you bother? Why would you bother doing this? What, what are the benefits? You know, what are the reasons that you'd want to share your data? You know, um, what, what's in it for you? So that, that's some of the things that we'll explore today in that sense. The, the social architecture, is certainly a big part of it. This is all around the governance, the governance of the Soil Data Federation and the governance of the data and the stewardship of the data and um, issues relating to data ownership and licensing and data trust and all those sort of things as well. Um, there's also, um, the technical architecture. So the technical architecture is kind of um, not as difficult, perhaps, or it's more difficult for the tech guys, but not as not as more straightforward in some respects. Although, of course, it has its its real challenges. How do you do it? How do you provide access to disparate data in disparate locations and and in provide access control so that the the rules are respected? You know, for people's access control rules. So when we started the project, we had a, a four day workshop in Ballarat uh, where we explored the sort of expectations of the users. What do you want to get out of it? What, what's, what's in it for you? And then we went around and visited each of the participants, the Grail Group participants in their own location and explored that further. What specifically would they like to get out of it? What was the, the hook, if you like, to allow them to, to, to you know, feel comfortable about sharing their data within the soil CRC. And so in here, we found a few value propositions. The first one of those was that for a lot of the groups, it was really just about improving data management and skills. This idea that you know, uh, data sitting around on data keys and floppy disks and things, you know, uh, it'd be really nice if it could be in one place and, and have some control. And then along with that, the ability to then collate it, to you know, look, at, look at it efficiently, to, have the, you know, to grow the knowledge and understanding, not just for the group, but for the members of the group as well. And then use those data as evidence for decisions in funding applications or for you know, soil health uh, trends or other uh, aspects. And, and particularly, I think for the groups, the big hook really is this idea of engagement with their members, offering something to their members that their members don't currently have. And so from that point of view, I think, you know, it's a real benefit and, and also gives you the opportunity to collaborate 
with and connect to the wider industry. Good example of that for ex at the moment is with Riverine Plains, you know, we've got some of their data in the Soil Data Federation and we can use those data in a, in a project that's currently GRDC funded project, that GRDC funded projects using machine learning, artificial intelligence to extract the maximum value from soil and crop variability. It's, it's run by the University of Adelaide. We're partners in that project, so are Riverine Plains. And those data become the, the fuel for the artificial intelligence engines. Of course, there are concerns with sharing data. And those concerns are around privacy and security and trust and context. You know, will the data be misused? You know, you have to know the context of, in which the data was collected and for what purpose and everything, and, and, and people are concerned about those sorts of things. There's also concerns around resources, you know, just the time and the skills, the, the people resources, you know, the, the partners in this project have access to $10,000 each to cover some of that time to set up the, the system for them in the first place. And then hopefully after that, it becomes a kind of self-serve system. And then there's this sort of other one concern, which was this appropriate respect for the grower groups and, and, and the project managers and stuff. Too often, you know, too often researchers come along and grab the data and run away and do their favorite research project and the group never hears anything, you know, any of the results or anything about it again. So there's this idea of if we could build into this system some idea of who's using the data, what are they using it for, you know, how can we actually sort of uh, get the benefit that those researchers are going to to have in using those in the, in the, using those data. And so you know it was clear from the outset that communications is really the key in this. You know this regular relevant communications, clear instructions. You know. And we've tried to do that. We've had regular newsletters. We've put out some little short videos. There's a, a really nice little animated video explainer on the Soil CRC website, on the Soil CRC video channel that you can go and have a look at, uh, that explains, explains it quite nicely. But also we've put out some reports. There's a discussion paper on the Soil CRC members area around the data governance and stewardship uh, questions. And there's also a report that will be loaded up in the next week or so once it clears uh, the Soil CRC uh, to look at the findings from our in social research and engagement project. Now, you know, the, the key elements to this particular Soil Data Federation really sit with fair data. Fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. The fair data movement, the fair data movement started in about 2016. It's, you know, guidelines were published in Nature, uh, scientific data, and the fair data movement is really taking off around the world. So to be findable, data has to, data has to be, you know, you might have data, but unless you put it somewhere and you, you expose it somewhere with metadata, we, we can't see it, we can't find it. So the data has to be findable. Accessible doesn't mean it has to be open. It doesn't mean it has to be openly accessible. It just means that the rules for data access have to be known uh, in that respect. So, um, you know, accessible means, can I access the data? Under what conditions can I access those data? It might be licensing, it might be a cost, it could be, you know, for free, community. Interoperable means that it's machine to machine understanding of those data so that the data are completely understandable from one machine to another. Uh, and that, that in, involves, you know, data, international data standards and all those sort of things. And then reusable means that, you know, long after the project's finished, 20 years after the project's finished, those data are still perfectly understandable in terms of how the data was collected, the analysis, you know, the type of analysis, the standards that were used. Um, the units of measure, all those sorts of things are carried with the data so that they're, they're, they're reusable. And then of course, there's all this stuff around trust and relationships and certification so that we have core trust seal and so that the repositories from which the data are coming 
are not, you know, fake data, if you like. They're, they're, they have some, uh, you know, credibility, or at least you know what credibility they have. So in the data access controls, you know, our, our mantra is it's your data, you set the rules, right? So we don't own the data, it's not ours, it's yours. So, so you set the rules on, on how those data might be accessed. So for grower groups, for example, you know, those access controls may allow visibility to the public or just to the club members, you know, the group, or to an individual. And, and you know, those data could be, for example, you know, some groups might feel happy to expose their data on the basis that they contribute to other data sets. You know, for example, uh, this data set that we're looking at here, which is part of uh, Nathan Robinson's PhD project in 2016, digital soil mapping. So we're looking there at a uh, soil pH layer um, at depth, subsoil pH layer, uh, and it's it's constructed using, you know, the variety of available data sources, but but you don't know where they're from. They're anonymized in that, in that respect. Or you might have embargoes for data. For example, data that is, uh, you know, uh, not available this season, but maybe available in later later seasons. Or you know, data that might be fuzzied up so the location's not quite so accurate. Here's an example of some data in our patch. So these orange dots here are data where you can click on those data and you'll get a full suite of um, soil data available. These are uh, soil health monitoring sites in the Karangamite Catchment Management Authority area. Um, they're publicly available data. These triangles are data when you click on those, you'll go to a full description of those soil profiles on another website. So they're government data that sits on another website. These blue dots here are data from soil moisture probes from southern farming systems. And this is the public view in a sense that it tells you how full the bucket is at the moment. But if you wanted to get more information about those data, you can only get that via a login from, you know, through an authorised login from Southern Farming Systems. There are about uh, 300 million observations out of 70 probes in, in, those, in those ones. Here's a private view of uh, a set of data from the Wodi Yalik catchment. So in this one here, there's uh, 95 farmers who've contributed paddock data, soil paddock data from about 900 paddocks. There's about a thousand samples, uh, 15,000 observations ranging from 1994 to 2017 in this one. So here's a private view where the only people who can see these data this is what the group can see, but the only people who can actually see the soil data are the individuals who own that, and then they can look at trends and those sorts of things. The, the platform architecture is uh, where the, 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 you know, the, I don't really understand a lot about the platform architecture, it's really Andrew's case, but, but in effect, we try and take data via web services from people who can provide those web services. So other government agencies, CSIRO and so on. What you're seeing on screen here is what we're building for the grower groups where they'll be able to load up their data because they don't have that, that capability. We're creating that capability for them. So a secure area in a cloud-based server where they can load up their data and then those data go through a process that makes it more fair. It adds structure to the data with international standards, it adds controlled vocabularies to the data and so on, and then allows that to be seen according to the access rules that they allow. And so in the, uh, the current portal, um, there's about over 2000 data sets, the public data sets that are available most of these are queryable in the sense that if you highlight that and you click on it, you'll get to see the data behind it. There's metadata available to tell you where it's come from, what the age of the data is, or that, you know, whatever the metadata there is. And there's a keyword search at the top that allows you to select data. One of the problems, of course, is that with 2000 data sets, it quite quickly becomes too much. And so to help you sort out what it is that you want, there's a keyword search. 
that keyword search allows you then to, you know, further filter those data, the keyword that you searched on. And then when you eventually find the data that you're interested in, you can click on that and add it to the map and, uh, you know, see it on, in that respect. There's about, you know, 24,000, more than 24,677, 24, uh, at least, data sets in open data catalogues uh, with a, with, when you search soil as a keyword. So I've had Chris Barlow as a PhD student at uh, Federation University. She's done some very clever work with, uh, with some interesting, um, you know, uh, information around uh, what might be in those data sets. So a lot of them are duplicated, you know, a lot of them are uh, textual data sets. But, but we've identified 2,166 that are either point polygon or raster data at the moment. Most are legacy data sets. And then for private sector data, we've gone around to the grower groups. All of all the project partners we've visited have committed some test data or committed to supply some. Those that are coloured in red here have already given us some test data sets that we can, you know, put through this process that you can see up here on the screen to um, run through the the data and get it into the system so then they can play with it and tell us how they want to see it, what kind of tools they would like, all that sort of stuff. And the people with the green are yet to supply their uh, data sets. Uh, but the, this is the private sector data. Eventually, of course, all this becomes a self-serve system uh, for people to use. Um, once the data is in the system, you know, so you, the, this is an example from Burdick and Productivity Services. Uh, and so once the data is in the system, the grower groups get a login and, and with that login, there are a set of tools we've already developed, which just allow simple things like filtering those data, for example. Uh, so you can filter the data by sample date or uh, by uh, property. Uh, you can filter them by value, you know, show me all these soil organic carbon less than half a percent or more than half a percent or something or other. And then you can have them also color coded so that the uh, locations and shown as color coded data and a legend, of course, uh, with that. The, the latest piece that we're doing is really uh, this spatial data search. So in this spatial data search, because there's so many data sets, it'll you click on a spot or you can draw a polygon. You choose your drawing tool here. This is not yet available on, on the map, but we're working on it. You can click on a spot or draw a polygon and then it'll say, right, there were in this area here, there were 11 soil test sites. And of these, there were 361 observations and these were supplied by Burdick and Productivity Services. So at least the data's findable, you know it's there. You may have to contact them, you may have to get a login to, to see that. For the public data, you can click on these here. So in the Queensland soil survey sites, there are uh, so many matches of data and it comes up and shows you what they are. And then when you can click on the chemistry results, for example, it'll show you the chemistry results for those data. And these are coming direct from the Queensland government databases. So if they changed a minute ago, you know, the, the, the data's up to, up to date, as up to date as we can possibly make it anyway. And so in the, um, you know, value proposition for fair data, there are lots of benefits that we see in this. You know, current research practice represents an investment that you make that disappears over time. These things become unreadable after a while. You know, the people who collected the data are gone and you can't remember whether, you know, what does, how, how, how it was done, you know, what test did they use? Uh, what does uh, Bill's coefficient mean or, or something, you know? Um, and so it's a matter of structuring all of this data into the fair system, you know, and, and that helps verify the research outcomes from past work. It helps, you know, maximise the potential for future research. 
it enhances societal outcomes. Now, and beyond that, you know, there's this thing about data being the new oil. We saw the four corners last night, for those of you who saw it, you know, all about artificial intelligence, you know. You know as time progresses and we're in this big data revolution, uh, the only way that we'll actually get anywhere is if the data that we're using is really well structured and really uh, reusable kind of data, because that becomes the oil to feed those artificial intelligence machine learning. That's the way we make new discoveries. And that's the way that the researchers in the soil CRC can reap the benefits and, and hopefully the partners can also reap the benefits. So that's the presentation. I'll stop there and we'll uh, throw it in questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Pete. Uh, that's, that's really good. So we've got a bit over 15 minutes for, for questions. There's a few questions typed in the Q and A box. And if, there's a, if you scroll to the top, Pete, you can see them. There's a the first one there from Andrea, Andrea Kosh. Are you able to read them, Peter? Uh, yes, thank you very much. So the first question here uh, is from Andrea. Thanks, Andrea, on the uh, Australian Farm Data Code, which the NFF's put out. Uh, look, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful to see the uh, NFF coming up with the Farm Data Code. We're seeing quite a lot of um, examples of governance and stewardship frameworks uh, that are popping up around the place. I, I think it's great. And these uh, sort of fair data guidelines, the core trust seal, the um, you know stewardship and governance frameworks, there's a whole collection of these that were done for the AgriFed project. These are the ones that we are in a sense basing the VAS on. It's not our data, you know, we don't, we, it's not our data, we don't set the rules. So it's really important um, ar around that. And so, yeah, we're, we're hopefully that's, we'll, we'll take them into account. Uh, next question is from Nancy. Uh, do you change units to a common unit? Um, we, we, we don't, but we do have uh, soil, we do have controlled vocabularies and we also have controlled units. So in the, so, uh, I might throw to Andrew to, to answer this because you're more across the AGC guidelines, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've also got Megan um, online, but I'm not sure she'd be able to um, comment, but um, basically uh, part of the, uh, the process of, of reviewing each data set is that um, we, uh, align them to standard vocabularies and units of measure um, that um, are centrally controlled by um, a, 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 um, an agreed um, governance. And so it should be um, possible to uh, convert between those, you know, or use uh, transfer functions. Um, but that's, that's, I suppose, we need to make sure as long as we know which unit uh, we receive it in, um, then it's it, it it gets mapped accordingly. Thanks. Um, so, next question from Jenny Coldham is: Are uh, grower groups, other grower groups, able to join the project now or participate in sharing data? Uh, does it matter if the data is just a snapshot in time, or does it need to be collected over time? So um, three questions there, the good, really good questions and common questions. So uh, are, there, are other grower groups able to join the project now? Um, that's something that the steering committee's been discussing. Um, I'm all for it myself, I'm, I'm quite happy, but it, it is a fact that the Soil CRC are funding it and that the money comes through the Soil CRC. So at the moment, it's, we're working with just the participants in the project. Uh, as the project develops in time, I would like to see a set of conditions under which other grower groups would be able to join the project. And I, 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 to be honest, I'd like to see that fairly quickly. And it may be that Michael has to comment on that um, uh, as well. Uh, thanks, Pete. Yes, I mean, 
they're, they're to our long term, longer term aspiration, our medium term aspiration, but our immediate um, priority, it, our immediate um, objective is to give priority to those existing participants in in the soil CRC. Uh, so, essentially, supporting what you just said, Peter. And uh, you know, the portal is public, so. So you can go there, any, anyone can go there, anyone in the world can go to the portal and look at it and they'll see what people have made publicly available. What they won't see is what the groups have decided to keep behind the login for themselves um, in, in that respect, you know. So, uh, and does it matter if it's a snapshot in time? Absolutely not. You know, as long as that's clear, that doesn't matter at all. So. I mean, to get trends over time, it's really nice to have a time series, of course, and we do have that in some cases, but sometimes all we've got is just one value that was taken in 1973. And it could be, you know, fantastically important because it's a benchmark from 1973 that shows whether we're, you know, improving or, or not from that point. Uh, Nick's question, yes, Nick. Oh, sorry, Peter, I'll just come back in. I was just reflecting upon what I said in case it sounded too dismissive. Um, yeah, listen, if, if there is interest out there and we can mount an argument, you know, back to the, the Commonwealth and the Australian government in, in different ways, uh, lined up with the national source strategy and, and, and recognising the, the importance of being able to access data and share data for, for the reasons you've just spoken about. Um, yeah, you know, if, if, if the market's there for it, uh, we'll take the arguments back to the Commonwealth and, and look for those uh, additional opportunities to support it uh, in addition to what we have for the CRC. I think the other thing is that um, we've already spotted some opportunities to um, align it with other projects in that case that we're involved in, but things like the uh, Agricultural um, Research um, Federation through the uh, Australian Research Data Commons um, and uh, the project that Pete mentioned earlier through through GRDC, there may be other avenues we're intending to use the, the same technical infrastructure. Um, it's just, I guess, about how we, um, uh, we're prioritising in terms of the VAS project, those partners, but there may be other ways to. The next question about what happens at the end. This, this occupies the mind a great deal. So it's a federation, right? So the idea is, who owns the Federation? It's owned by the members of the Federation. And so uh, what is it that won't survive? What may not survive might be, for example, the system that we build that allows grower groups to put stuff in. We believe that you know, by the, by the time the CRC ends, that the technologies will have got to the point where you'll be able to do that yourself, you know, where you'll be able to, um, you know, expose data to the Federation. And so we hope that the Federation will continue. If, if, if we've done our job right, and if the value proposition's there, and if people really think this is a great thing, it will continue, you know, it will continue to, to be there because the costs are imposed on those who wish to join the Federation, a bit like, you know, the costs are involved at the moment with the state government agencies, CSIRO, the universities and others who are supplying data to that federation. Um, and so they just set up the infrastructure and then, you know, you could go to, anyone can go to, anyone at all can go to CSIRO and look at the web services or to the state government, look at the web services, the APIs and all those sort of things. For grower groups to do that, we ho we're hoping that the technology will catch up and that it won't be an impost on that. That's about the best answer I've got. Any comments there, Andrew? No, that's that's great. Um, so, uh, Richard, yes, good question. How we capture useful data from other projects? Well, there is a new project that's uh, we're just starting, which is around having data standards for the projects that are being done through the Soil CRC. And so, hopefully, that project will also develop the. Uh, rule set, if you like, the framework, the guidelines to capture those data from the projects that are currently running. Universities have an awful lot of data. It frustrates the hell out of me that it data flows at the moment are one way. Universities are saying, can we get your data please for our research? 
it would be really nice to see the universities pushing data back to use for the grower groups and for everyone else. This is a really big mission that, that we want to see in the VAS, you know. So uh, hopefully, you know, that, that will happen at least within the university partners within the Soil CRC working on Soil CRC projects. But we're seeing it also from GRDC and others you know, uh, as well, who are, who are now saying, you know, that their data must be more available. And the second question from Richard, to make this site more increasingly useful, um, you know, to, to encourage greater data sharing. Yes, well, this is really the value proposition. You know, if we can make this as useful as possible with tools, with the ability to print out PDF reports on demand, with um, whatever it is, whatever it is that the, that the users want to see, if we can do that, then we're, we're making it a success, you know. At the end of the day, no one forces you to use Facebook or Twitter. You do that because there's a value proposition that you see in that, you know. Hopefully this will be the same. Megan, uh, oh yes, you're just answering the question for us, thank you. Yes, we can go between units of measure, preferably uh, uh, by provider for display, that's, that's great. Um, Nancy, the challenge is experienced in collating data. The biggest challenge we've got is time. Time, you know, just the data that we're seeing from the grower groups, no offence to the grower groups, but it is uh, a little messy, you know, it, in some cases. And so just going, going back to them to sort that out, to, to get the better, you know, over time, they'll get be better and better at managing their data. They'll get better and better because we'll have these guidelines and frameworks there. But with the legacy data, you know, the changes in paddock names, you know, Andrew's paddock one year and Drew's paddock the next year and Andy's paddock the next year, you know, are they the same, are they different? All that sort of stuff is just, yeah, it's, it's, it's been quite a, a difficulty. In, I think the it's the variety. We do get some really high quality um, data sets, but we've set a fairly high benchmark in terms of the, um, that fairness that um, Pete spoke about and getting good quality metadata and provenance and, and, and to only have to do that once, I guess. And so that's probably taken us longer than we, we anticipated and, and also uh, involves a fair bit of um, back and forth and I think the big challenge for us to be able to get that um, that self-serve system is to have a lot of those checks and balances and questions that you need to ask built into the system so I think that's going to be our big challenge. Uh, Catherine's question is there scope to include social and institutional layers it's the most common question we get Catherine is is you know can we put other layers in can we put paddock data in can we put yield data in can we put you know, social and institutional uh, layers in. It's the most common question we have. And so we're thinking about it, we're discussing it with the steering committee. Uh, you know, how strictly do we keep it to just soil or do we add other stuff that's, that's really useful? Um, Hannah Beth's question. Uh, it's a good point about data storage. Yes, <laughs> that, that's true. Uh, what, What's the most useful and accessible format for us to store project data in? Um, at the moment, it doesn't really matter to us as long as it's structured, you know, whether it's in Excel or whether it's in a database or something, as long as it's structured and, uh, and understandable. And then eventually with the soil CRC, we'll have um, Nathan's project, which will, Nathan Robinson's project, which will have guidelines for, um, you know, data formats uh, sort of thing. And just in the last couple of minutes uh, here, I've got Richard's question um, is uh, the next steps. So we've got two milestones this year. One of them is to uh, have some online educational tools for the grower groups. And the second one is some tools. Now the extent of those tools, we're still discussing with the grower groups. They're due in November, those two. After that, if the project continues, that's the end of this round of funding, but hopefully if the project uh, continues, we will develop much stronger and better toolkits, including visualizations and stuff, as the data grows and as people want 
more demands from the system. And in particular, I imagine we'll have demands from people who want to use these data directly into decision support tools like AppSim or like machine learning or artificial intelligence tools or those sorts of things. And that's really where I, I think this, this will really come into its own. That's it, Michael. Yeah, well done, Peter. Got for a, a dozen questions or so there, and, and Andrew too. So, um, and good answers to them all. Um, and we're yeah, pretty much on time. Right. So, let me wrap it up. Uh, I think uh, for the audience there across Australia and indeed across the world, we do have quite a few international people uh, uh, linked in. I think this has demonstrated. Um, the importance of this area of activity within the soil CRC. This really is one of our flagship projects. Uh, still the early days of the soil CRC, but Peter and his team have made great progress and, and being true to the ethos of the soil CRC, being driven by the, the needs of our end users. So if you have uh, further questions and information, please follow up with Peter. Um, you'll be able to find his email there at the uh, just tell us what your email is again. Uh, so p.dolhouse at federation.edu.au. If you go to Federation Uni Ballarat, you'll find me. Yeah, very good. Thank you. All right. So, in, in wrapping up, uh, let me just uh, come back to advertising our future webinars and uh, if you're inspired by this, we've got quite a range of different topics coming up uh, with uh, the service webinar end of June, um, looking more at a, how we encourage and incentivize farmers and reward farmers for good soil stewardship uh, through opportunities for activating consumer markets. And then later in July, a focus on um, <coughs> liquid injection biosolids as a way of uh, addressing soil constraints and improving productivity. So, up, go to our website, follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, go to our YouTube site. This webinar has been recorded. It will be made available in coming days for you to look at again or to uh, let your colleagues know what they've missed out on and uh, they can follow up on the information there. So I'm going to um, close the webinar there. Thank Peter and Andrew and the project team once again for their presentations and wish you well for the rest of the day. See you in two weeks. Thank you.